Hi. Once again, I hope you enjoyed your luncheon. My name is Rich Godwin. I'm a board member of NSS, proud board member. Um, our next guest, you know, you all know who he is, and he doesn't really need an introduction. But this is the first time I've actually introduced him, even after knowing him for 12 years. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of background. You know all the things about what this gentleman has done in his life. Um, those of you who don't know me know that I'm not from this neck of the woods. And uh, when I was at boarding school in England, 13 years old, when they landed on the moon, my career teacher asked me, he said, well, so what do you want to do with your life? I said, I want to be like one of the astronauts. Oh, which one? Neil Armstrong, John Glenn? I said, no, Buzz Aldrin. Why him in particular? I said, because this guy actually knows all of the stuff about this. He was on the Gemini 12 mission when the, uh, the rendezvous computer went out. There's nobody else, I don't believe, that could have docked to that Agena vehicle with a sextant and a slide roll than Buzz. It's, it's just as well he was on that flight. He also showed us how to do EVA efficiently without half killing yourself, which is most of the other astronauts had done. And there's a reason why he was standing next to Neil Armstrong on that first uh, moon landing. So that was why. So I've got a couple of Buzz stories. Um, people who know Buzz have Buzz stories. He was actually the catalyst behind my company being formed, Apogee Books. Uh, we were having dinner out in Los Angeles, and uh, my brother was sat with us, and he said, um, turned to my brother, so what do you do? Oh, I'm a book publisher. Hey, how about publishing a book about some buddies of mine? It's Apollo 8 um, commemoration. And Rob said, what do you do? It's Buzz Aldrin. So I said, yes. You know? but he changed our company from being a rock and roll publisher to being um, a space book publisher, hopefully the space book publisher. And uh, he still keeps asking me for the royalty checks, but you know, they're, they're, not, they're not on the up and up. Um, but my main Buzz story on that... Uh, Apollo 8 commemoration back in 1998. Uh, it was a big, there was a big do at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And uh, Buzz called me on the phone and said, can you see if we can put this back a day or two? And I said, the whole city's gonna be there. This is a big do, Buzz. I said, why? He said, well, I've got a breakfast presentation at the Jules Verne Club in Paris that morning. Then I've got a luncheon appointment doing a presentation at the Royal Society in London. I suppose I could be in Chicago by dinner time. <laughs> Holy moly. And that, that is what his schedule is like. So I said, look, just get on a plane, get in for six o'clock, don't have checked baggage, I'll, I'll fix it, I'll pick you up. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it's Friday evening, it's rush hour, Chicago, there's no way I'm gonna get him from O'Hare down to uh, the Museum of Science and Industry in less than an hour. What shall I do? Call around to helicopter companies. I call helicopter companies. First guy, would you fly a VIP for free? Who is it? Buzz Aldrin, no problem. <laughs> so I met Buzz off the plane. I said, come on, we've got a limo outside to take us 200 yards to the helicopter. Uh, and uh, the, the, I think he was a marine pilot. He'd been from, he'd flown in uh, Desert Storm, flying Apaches. And he was just thrilled to meet Buzz. And uh, stood there, saluted him right in front of the helicopter. Uh, asked him if he'd like to sit left seat. And uh, Buzz said, sure, yeah. I'm sitting in the back with my headphones on thinking, I'm in a flying machine with Buzz Aldrin. There's three of us. Can I be Neil? You know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we flew together over Chicago at nighttime. Got down to Miggs Field. My wife picked us up. Got us there in time for the uh, commemoration with uh, Jim Lovell, Frank Borman, and Bill Anders. Those guys had to rush off. So Buzz was being inundated with people wanting his autograph. And I said to him, Buzz, Branson is in town tonight doing the Virgin Megastore opening. And he said, oh, I need to talk to him. I said, let's go to the Virgin Megastore opening. So he popped in the car, drove down to Chicago. Branson had been called off at the last minute to do his balloon flight out of Morocco. So he hadn't turned up. So I said, okay, let's go for dinner. So now I'm not realizing that Buzz is on Paris time, so he's already seven hours ahead of us. And I'm not thinking how tired he should be. So we sat down, Smith and Walensky had a, had a dinner, great dinner, and the helicopter pilot was there with us because that was his reward to sit and have dinner with Buzz. 
We drop Buzz off at the hotel, and uh, we go back to Miggs Field to pick up the helicopter. It's midnight by this time. Guess what? Miggs is closed, locked up. And we said, so Craig, well, what are we going to do? We better call. We called, no answer, called the cops. Oh, it closes at 10.30, don't you know that? Oh, man. Craig says, I'm going to climb the fence. I said, you'll get shot. No cop with a pop gun's going to shoot me. I flew in Desert Storm. OK. <laughs> so he climbed the fence. We said, just call us when you get in your bird, which he did. And uh, he flew away. Next morning, we see on the news, helicopters stolen from Miggs Field. <laughs> we had to call in and explain the whole situation to them. So that's one of my buzz stories. And uh, I still don't think he believes all of it. Um, but as I said, it's a great honor to introduce one of the great space visionaries of our time. He's been unwavering in his dedication to opening the frontier for all of us. And uh, so it's with great honor to introduce uh, a good friend and um, a great space visionary, Buzz Aldrin. Thank you. Thank you very much. I went back to get this since he was talking about uh, trips. I just came from uh, Baikonur, uh, and this is uh, the flag of the Belgian, the uh, Canadian, and the uh, uh, Russian cosmonauts. Uh, it was really quite an experience uh, seeing their uh, suit up procedures where they do it one at one at a time pressure checks and there's a whole gallery of people and photographies and glass in front and everybody has to wish them well and give them a little bit of a talk here and there um, I said a few words and I guess it got on TV somewhere <clears throat> I'm not sure that this trip uh, was uh, typical but I started out about uh, 10 days ago and had a one night stand in uh, uh, Milan, Italy, then uh, Athens, gave a talk there. A uh, couple days with my wife in Paris. She went home, I went to Amsterdam, spent the night, talked to Isa, then we went to Moscow. One night, Baikonur, back to Moscow, and here I am. Two nights again, that's pretty nice, but I do get home for two nights before I'm off again to do something or other. Um, this is going to be a little unusual um, because I'm going to require you people to multitask and that's going to be kind of difficult for the people in the back because you may have to read some things up here while I'm talking and they may not be in sync at all. Uh, but but uh, these are some bullet points that I've put together uh, and, uh, and I think you'll uh, appreciate uh, that it's a little bit more of a, of a logic. The, uh, the words I'm going to read, unfortunately, and, and not just have an open discourse, uh, are from uh, op-ed pieces that we've worked over for general audience uh, understanding. Um, and when I get through with some of those, uh, I'll uh, finish up with a little bit of uh, some discussion about uh, some things I think we ought to be doing in the future. But all this is sort of laying the groundwork for, uh, obviously, a bit of a change. Um, I guess when I really started thinking of what I was uh, involved in doing uh, for the future, it was um, U.S. global space leadership and uh, before the election, uh, or right after, it was held up by, by two pillars. One of them was uh, enlightened uh, uh, progressive change, parentheses Obama, and the other one was enlightened cooperation. Uh, and so those themes are uh, kind of running throughout uh, how I feel we need to look at what it is we're doing. Um, 
I would normally have uh, teleprompters here in uh, imitation of our Commander-in-Chief, uh, but these guys have been really nice to, to do some uh, sort of unusual ways of, uh, well, I was going to read this from a computer, but th that was inconsistent with the way that these things are set up. So I've got op-eds that I'll be reading instead of nice uh, projecting them to you with, uh, with teleprompters. Um, so that takes multitasking. You listen to what I say, you look up there and try and understand both of them. And uh, I've learned that multitasking makes you uh, y a lot younger. And I'm doing two and three things at once. I can't mention them all in the shower. Uh, <laughs> So, so there's soap, toothpaste, toothbrush, and a razor all going around at the same time. <clears throat> um, recently, I was inducted into the, uh, th these are going to change automatically at, uh, at one minute intervals, I believe. Uh, yeah, here they go. Uh, there goes the beginning of one minute. I was inducted into the New Jersey Hall of Fame recently, <clears throat> and I got a, a chance to meet a little short guy, a baseball player. <clears throat> when I moved out of Montclair, New Jersey, he moved in, uh, Yogi Berra. And he has some really interesting things to say. I don't know who wrote his introduction speech as he presented me, uh, but he said, uh, this is one of the smartest astronauts. Uh, in, in the business. And when I got up to uh, receive the award, I said, hey, Yogi, how many astronauts do you really know? <laughs> anyway, you will remember his, one of his most famous phrases, uh, if there's a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> <clears throat> and, and we have a fork in the road. Uh, and, and we may keep going in, in a particular direction, or we may take that fork, or we may uh, go one way and then realize we should have taken it. Or we could just sit there and, and uh, mumble and do nothing at the fork, because it does require decisions. Uh, <clears throat> this op-ed is uh, called, Time to Boldly Go Again, Star Trek. Yeah. You guys know how to do this? I mean, uh, I don't know whether you can see that or not, but that, that's what you do when you haven't got anything else to do. <laughs> <clears throat> On the spring morning of 1927, when Charles Lindbergh flew alone across the Atlantic Ocean, only he and a handful of explorer adventurers were capable of attempting the feat. Many had tried before Lindbergh's successful flight, but all had failed, many losing their life in the process. Most thought transatlantic travel was an impossible dream. But 40 years later, 20,000 people a day were safely flying the same route that the Lone Eagle had voyaged alone. Transatlantic flight had become routine, virtually commonplace. This summer marks 40 years since Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, and I flew the quarter million miles through the blackness of space to reach the moon. Neil and I walked its dusty ancient soil, becoming the first humans to stand upon another world. Yet today, no nation, including our own, is capable of sending anyone beyond Earth's orbit, much less deeper into space. For the past four years, NASA has been on a path to resume lunar exploration with people, duplicating yet more complicated what Neil, Mike, and I and our colleagues did four decades ago. But I contend that this approach called vision for space exploration is neither visionary nor will it ultimately be successful in restoring American space leadership. Like its Apollo predecessor, this plan will prove to be another dead end, littered with broken spacecraft, broken dreams, and broken policies. Instead, I propose a new unified space vision, 
a plan that will ensure American space leadership for the 21st century. It doesn't require building new rockets from scratch, as the current plans do. And it makes maximum use of the capabilities we now have without breaking the bank. It's a reasonable and affordable plan if we again think in visionary terms. On television and in the movies, Star Trek showed what could be achieved when we dared to boldly go where no man had gone before. In real life, I've traveled that path, and I know that with the right goal and the support from the Americans, we can boldly go again. A race to the moon is a dead end. While lunar surface can be used to develop more advanced technologies, it's a poor location for homesteading. A lifeless, barren world, its stark desolation is matched with the hostility to all living things. Replaying the glory days of Apollo will not advance the cause of American space leadership, nor has it inspired the support and enthusiasm of the public and the next generation of space explorers. I'm not suggesting that America abandon the moon entirely. Only forego a moon-focused race. As the moon should be for all mankind, we should return to the moon as part of an internationally-led coalition using the landers and heavy lift boosters developed by our partners. We could test on the moon the tools and equipment that we will need for our ultimate destinations, homesteading Mars by way of its moons. Let the lunar surface be the ultimate global commons while we focus on more distant and sustainable goals to revitalize our space program. I would instead issue a call to the next generation to think boldly in terms of a goal for the space program, Mars for America's future, and not a few visits to plant flags and do photo ops, but a journey to make the first homestead in space, an American colony on a new world. Robotic exploration of Mars has yielded tantalizing clues about what was once a wet and water-soaked planet. Deep beneath the soils of Mars may lay trapped frozen water, possibly with traces of still extant primitive life forms. Climate change on a vast scale has reshaped Mars. With Earth now in the throes of its own climate evolution, Human outposts on Mars could be a virtual laboratory to study these vast planetary changes. And the simplest, most inexpensive way to study Mars is with the two hands, eyes, and ears of a geologist, first at the moon orbiting Mars and then on its surface. Mobilizing the space program to focus on a human colony on Mars, while at the same time helping our international partners explore moon on their, uh, on their own with our help would galvanize their public support for space and give America's young students a cause to get involved in. Mars exploration would renew our space industry by opening up technology development to all players, not just the traditional big aerospace contractors. If we avoided the put pitfall of aiming solely on the moon, we could be on Mars by the 60th anniversary year of the Apollo 11 flight. We could. I challenge America's leadership in this year of reflection upon our historic 1969 lunar journey to think boldly and to look beyond the moon to Mars for America. Yes, my vision requires bold thinking. My friend and Gemini crewmate, Jim Lovell, calls our Apollo days a time when we did bold moves in space to achieve leadership. It's time we were bold again in space. Next op-ed. Make the International Space Station truly international. 
All across America, plans are being made to commemorate our nation's journey to the moon in July 1969. There will be much reflection on Apollo 11, the Apollo program, what it meant then and still means today. Our Apollo missions will be categorized as bold scientific endeavors. And the dawn of human exploration into the cosmos, which they certainly were, having been made possible by new partnerships between the private sector, government, and academia. All of this is true, but Apollo's most significant purpose may well have been overlooked. Apollo was a strategic program, and if we wish to return to global space leadership, then we need to return to strategic thinking in terms of the value of space exploration. Apollo came to symbolize American global space leadership and the strength of the nation's capitalist economy and technical prowess. Cast in terms of a peaceful quest for scientific and engineering excellence, it was a powerful foreign policy tool. Nations that may have differed with the U.S. international policies, <clears throat> our presence in Vietnam and even our Cold War adversaries admired America for the boldness and openness of its lunar exploration program. While NASA went to the moon, it did so with the hopes, dreams, and the admiration of all the people on Earth who embraced the journey as an endeavor for all humankind. We went to the moon, but it was a journey shared and embraced by all. New global partnerships were formed and cultural exchanges made. It became a shining symbol that all of America aspired to be and why we sought to be the world's leader in science and technological progress. Today, however, the space program's most successful recent achievement uh, the building of the International Space Station has yet to realize its full potential as a truly international endeavor for spacefaring nations across the globe. While many international partners helped create this incredible engineering achievement, only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. Only those who will risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. T.S. Eliot. Access to the station is limited, and it is difficult for new partners to become players in this new high frontier. Instead of using the ISS as a symbol of American strategic leadership, and technological capability, its use is limited to only a handful of nations. In this year of Apollo commemoration, it's time to open the space frontier to the world for all who would choose to participate. These are main three items, and they'll be repeated with details uh, involving uh, each of the three major headings. As we near the completion of the International Space Station, we should rededicate it to a purpose that's worthy of its name, an international global colon, commons for the spacefaring community of nations, led by, not dominated by America. It's time that every nation that would like to play a role in the ISS be given an opportunity to do so. If we as Americans seek to improve our image abroad, <clears throat> then we can better do so with engagement than with competition. And we should add these new players to the ISS as true partners, not just participants. We should see their quest for space in the same light as our own, <clears throat> for national strategic values and for technological development. With the support and agreement of our current partners, by welcoming nations with space ambitions such as China, India, and Brazil to the station, we enhance our own stature, not weaken it. 
We should take full advantage of China's manned space program to carry American and other astronauts to and from low Earth orbit. We currently purchase flights aboard the Russian Soyuz and Progress spacecraft. And with our expanded partnerships, we could also have opportunities to partner with China for use of its Shenzhou for the same purpose. We should also welcome India's new fledgling manned space program to the new global columns, commons that the space station can represent for the world. <clears throat> Through partnering the resources of many nations, <clears throat> Through partnering, the resources of many nations will lower the cost of access to space while forging stronger bond bonds that we can build upon to journey to more distant destinations, <clears throat> the moon and Mars beyond, a true low Earth orbit outpost that brings the strengths and accomplishments of each partner into developing research capabilities, logistics vehicles, and launch support to sustain the station well beyond current plans to end its life by 2016. With global use, the station can continue to serve mankind and Americans for many years to come, reaping the rewards from the billions we've invested in its use. But we must start in Earth orbit. It's time we made the International Space Station truly international. <laughs> Next, the moon for all mankind. What I remember most about my visit to the moon 40 years ago this summer was a place of magnificent desolation, a barren, stark, and lifeless landscape. It hardly seemed to beckon Neil Armstrong and I as we walked its dusty surface on human humanity's first mission to another world. I remember thinking any future settlers here would face daunting challenges, almost more than any one nation alone could sustain. Our visit, though, was a product of the Cold War, the Cold War challenge made eight years earlier. Nearly a half a century ago this month, 48 years ago, President John F. Kennedy came before Congress to make our lunar mission a reality by proposing a moon race as a national goal for America's space program. <clears throat> My Apollo 11 flight began a brief but successful exploration of its surface, accomplishing Kennedy's pledge within the timetable he set forth before the world. A promise made, a promise kept. We won the moon race with the Soviet Union. But today, America is on yet another race to the moon, this time to build a base on its surface and basically duplicate with much more cost and complexity what we had achieved during the days of our Apollo missions. Once again, our space program is focused on the moon, and once again, we will find that in addition to its desolation, it's a dead end. The original plan for the new space effort named the Vision for Space Exploration was to use the moon only as a technology testbed to develop the tools and capabilities to sustain Americans as we prepared for a journey to Mars. Yet in the focus on the moon first, we have forgotten the space program's ultimate destination. In this year of remembrance and reflection on my Apollo 11 mission, it's time we regain the focus and global space leadership, not by aiming back at the moon again, but by aiming at Mars for America's future. And in the process, make the moon available to all mankind. I propose we avoid another costly moon race by fostering a new international partnership to explore and exploit the moon. Instead of spending billions on moon rockets, <clears throat> landers, and other hardware, we should open the development of the moon 
to China, India, and other aspiring space powers. A Lunar Development Authority, an international lunar economic development authority in which America plays a partner and collaborator, not picking and choosing participants like some space-born colonial power. This would manage lunar resources and coordinate global exploration programs. America could return to the moon riding aboard the new spacecraft of our international partners. In that way, we can focus on technological development for our Mars explorations, the place for a true homestead in the next generation of Americans, a way to excite the public about space like it was when I voyaged to the moon in 1969 is to plan our first permanent colony on another world, Mars. We can get there in stepping stone fashion, starting with the moons orbiting the red planet. If we help with management and robotic research of the moon, our lunar partners can thrive. America can gain global leadership and renewed respect for our ideas by helping to advance the space goals of China, India, Brazil, Europe, Japan, Russia, and all who seek to use space to advance their national interests, just as we have done. We can test equipment that the Mars colonists will need, such as new life support technology and power generating systems. These may also have applications here on Earth. We won't honor Apollo 11 by repeating its mission. If we really believe in the peaceful exploration of space for humanity, isn't it time we helped to make it a reality for all humanity? On the leg of the lunar lander that took me to the moon was attached a small metal plaque. It told the world that we had come there in peace for all mankind. Now, four decades later, it's time for America to help make good on that pledge. Let's make the moon available to the world and Mars the homestead of the next generation of American explorers. Before I go into the last one, let me just read what is hard for you folks to read. It says a closing thought. We're not closing quite yet. <clears throat> as soon as somebody demonstrates the art of flying, settlers from our species of man will not only be lacking on the moon and Jupiter. Given ships or sails adapted to the breezes of heaven, there will be those who will not shrink from even that vast expanse. And that was Johannes Kepler, 1610. And that was a letter to Galileo. How'd you like to have been reading that letter? <laughs> Mars for America's future. I believe that this nation should commit itself to the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. With those words, President John F. Kennedy set in motion a challenge before the world, win the space race with a bold mission of exploration and discovery. Four decades ago, sealed inside the cabin of our Apollo 11 command module, Neil Armstrong, Mike Collins, and I roared off the launch pad at Kennedy Space Center to fulfill JFK's challenge. Three days we coasted through the blackness of space, a sky darker than anything I had ever seen before. During the descent to the moon's surface, our lunar lander, the Eagle, nearly ran out of fuel as we searched for a touchdown site. Then, for two and a half hours, Neil and I walked the ancient lunar soils, set up scientific instruments and our flag spoke with the president and marveled on the incredible progress that had led to our journey. The next day, we rocketed up to join Mike Collins, orbiting alone, 
in the command module ship Columbia. Three days later, we were floating in the Pacific Ocean. As someone once said, mission accomplished. America and much of the world erupted in celebrations. America's can-do spirit cast a warm glow across nations and cultures, generating more goodwill and support for our country's ideals and causes than had otherwise been possible. A whole generation of young Americans was inspired to become scientists, engineers, and even for some future astronauts. The fruits of our Apollo mission and those that followed were plentiful. Now, four decades later, America is in search of a new inspiration and a new focus for the space program. President Obama has appointed a commission to review NASA's current plans to return to the moon and the mix of capsules and rockets to get us there. But the commission probably won't consider why this goal for space program has failed to inspire our youngsters and what to do to galvanize public support for a reinvigorated space program. To do that, I believe we must avoid going back to the future in another moon race. We must lift our eyes higher to Mars and its moon. We have, in the past few years, lost sight of the original plan announced five years ago of only using the moon as a stepping stone to more distant voyages. We've become fixated on the moon, but having been there and stood on its surface, I can tell you that the moon is a dead end for NASA. Instead of putting our focus on energies and emphasis on recreating the moon race we won in 1969, we should only use the moon to prepare us for a challenge as great as JFK's proposal, Homestead Mars. Mars as our only focus can electrify the public interest in science and engineering, give our young people something to stimulate their educational goals and provide a rationale for global American space leadership. Using the moon as a true global commons for all nations to develop and explore. Homesteading Mars can reach, reap rich rewards in terms of scientific discovery and greater understanding of planet-wide processes such as climate change and weather. Mars, we know, was once wet and warm. Was it home to life? And what can living and learning to work on its rust-colored surface teach us about the future of our own planet Earth? Answering these mysteries may hold the key to our future. On the 40th anniversary of our lunar journey, it's time we challenged ourselves once again to be bold and explore the true unknown. Mars for America's future is where we should be headed. That's the best way to commemorate Apollo 11, not replay the past, but call the next generation to make some new history of their own. Thank you. Thank you ma'am. I'm not through yet. I've used the term unified space vision. I put the vision at the, at the end of the phrase, and it's unified. Not united, we rarely do things in the world in a united way, but we make an attempt to unify. And I guess the two main ingredients of that unification is exploration and development. They're really two different things. We explore someplace, we find out is it worth developing, and then we go about developing it as appropriate. And we do this 
not just with government programs, not just with civil government and, and security space, but we need entrepreneurial, we need the private sector, we need all of these involved together in a unified way. And not only us, but we have to unify the participation of the international spacefaring people. Rarely will we ever be united, but we can be unified in what it is each of us is trying to do if we'll only use our minds to think beyond our nose and the short-term objectives of each and every one of these entities I've talked about. Each one wants to do something right now, but we've got to think beyond that. And that is one of the biggest challenges that humankind faces. Not only in the technical and world out there, but in the demographic world here, if you know what I mean. Um, I've coined a phrase that I think describes a little bit of what I'm uh, talking about and, and we'll get into just uh, in a, another detail or two. And it is uh, the use of the letter P six times. P to the sixth power. Presidential prerequisite pathways. That's what I'm talking about. A goal enunciated by our president of the prerequisite pathways to permanent planetary presence. That doesn't mean we're committing the resources to go all the way, it's a pathway. And we need the pathway somewhere to somewhere and it is to permanent planetary presence. But it's gonna need endorsement, probably around 19 or 2016, at the end of a two-year term, and maybe debated during the election of 2016 as to whether we want people on Phobos, that's a big step, three missions to Phobos, we bring the crew back after a year and a half. You know, I can't think of any more qualified three people than three people who spent a year and a half in orbit looking down at Mars from Phobos. We'll add a couple more people to them and then send them there. And the same with the second group of three. The third group, ah, instead of giving them a return spacecraft or propellant, we'll give them another lander so that they can wait a little longer and then land just before or just after the permanent crew get there. Now, it's kind of hard to accept the fact that we're talking about an analogy of the pilgrims on the Mayflower who didn't sit around Plymouth Rock waiting for the return trip the Polynesians who went to Hawaii didn't go there for a weekend of fishing and then take their fish back to where they came from. They went there to settle. And if we're not ready to commit to settling a small outpost, but big enough, I don't think five, six, or seven people can uh, sustain themselves with uh, in situ resource utilization. We need more than that. We need to accumulate them as soon as possible. And if you really look at the numbers, the cost of sending six people, five or seven, and then look at what it costs to send those people and uh, and bring them back, it's probably two, three times as much as it is to send them there in the first place. Now, are we really ready to do this? Maybe, maybe the answer is pausing at a stepping stone and, and as alluded to, looking for the minerals in the asteroids. But certainly, there are 
better things to do than to run around the moon looking for the asteroids that have impacted on the moon or trying to sell lunar oxygen to somebody. You're not going to bring it back to Earth. You're going to sell it to somebody who's going somewhere. And who is that somebody? That's us. How can we establish that we want to go to all that trouble of putting human people there and all the facilities to get lunar oxygen if we don't know the market value of Earth oxygen in Leo and Earth water or oxygen and fuel at L1? So that's why my program involves early establishment of refueling stations to cut down a bit on the size of the launch vehicles that, that we, we need. Um, I don't think I need to read this again, but let me back up one and talk about this very early concept of a spacecraft. <clears throat> this is something that I imagined was an, an exploration module in the center, and it might be something like the U.S. HAB that's put on the space station as a test bed to test the life support equipment that we need to develop for two, three year missions, because that's what it may take to abort from an outbound mission uh, going to Mars. Uh, now, since looking at at that simplified version of an of a exploration module, I've uh, run across some studies that were done on uh, Mars lander habitats and landers, both the same shape. They got heat shield on them. It's an inflatable heat shield, drogue chute, parachutes, rockets for touchdown and landing gear. Now you take off a bunch of that stuff and that's just what you need to, to go to Phobos. You put more thrust on it and landing gear, and that's what you need to go to the moon. But you need to pioneer something based on where it is you want to go. Uh, I really don't think Altair is the kind of uh, test vehicle for anything uh, going anywhere else but, but the moon when it has to put itself into lunar orbit along with the uh, uh, CEV. Uh, I'm showing two Orions here. If I was going on a one-year mission like, like an early one that uh, we might go to uh, in as early as 2018, I'd kind of like to have two Orions to come back after a year's journey. Now, if we have a test bed in, uh, in Earth orbit, um, and, and fly our first exploration module, 2016, something like that, check it out with an Orion, and then leave it in Earth orbit, co-orbiting with Bigelow Station, Chinese Space Station, because it'll eventually be used to co-orbit with uh, a refueling station in low Earth orbit. The number two exploration module, go on an Earth-Moon cycling orbit to establish the fact that we could do that and take people around the Moon and, and get them back here to Earth, but it's a test of different environments for some period of time, and then it ends up as a communication relay at L2 in a halo orbit, sending back wonderful pictures for uh, uh, screensavers. Just imagine what that would look like. Now the third one goes cycling orbits, Earth, Moon, and it is now the refueling station at L1. It's co-orbiting with what will be up there. Now this is a candidate, optimistic maybe, uh, of an XM mission to the comet uh, Vintanen. It leaves on uh, my wife's birthday, November 2nd, 2018. Pretty ambitious, and it uh, swings by uh, the comet a little over a month later on Pearl number 7th, and then it comes back a total of a year later. And so it's really long duration plus kind of a spectacular display for people back here looking at the tail of the comet, and we send a couple of uh, 
scientific penetrators or DOD kinetic kill vehicles. Anyway, we zap the comet and it uh, burps a couple times and we take TV pictures of it and uh, that, that's what excites people back here on Earth. It's people out there doing something, demonstrating what it is they're doing. Here, here's another mission just showing in relative coordinates. Uh, well, that's a loser. Anyway, the sun is this way, it's a rotating coordinate frame, and, and the Earth is always there. Obviously, it goes this way, but in this coordinate frame, it's, uh, thanks, it's always sitting there. So now we see things in relative motion. It's not, it's not that important. Oh, here we go. The Earth is always here, and of course, you, uh, if you're in orbit like this, you thrust downward, you're going to go up and forward and uh, up around like this. So this is the intercept, and, and here's the comet making this uh, uh, path by here. Um, and this, this happens to uh, be a, uh, a 2023 uh, mission. Let's look for a minute as some of the human elements the challenges of long duration flight. Radiation, microgravity, vacuum, temperature. Uh, we need to deal with the muscular system of the human and the skeletal system. And uh, in the lower right hand corner, there's an interesting uh, experiment going on at UC Irvine that I think holds a lot of promise. It's a uh, rotating merry-go-round where one person is uh, pedaling a bicycle and it turns around and of course in zero G it's going to be all out, out like this and uh, a minimum uh, volume usage of the uh, exploration module. And then at uh, 120 degrees you have platforms where people are lifting weights and doing things to uh, uh, exercise their uh, skeletal system. Uh, without disturbing the inner ear. We all know what happens there, uh, and we've got to do some tests on this with people. Uh, it's not a good uh, thing to test, particularly in the zero-gravity airplane, so some friends from Oceaneering are, are looking uh, at how we can take this device and do a little bit of testing for it. Now, this may be hard to look at or hard to see. It should be a little bit bigger, but this is an asteroid uh, 2001 GP2, and uh, uh, that's when it was discovered. And of course, its path is this way, and the rotating coordinate frame, here's the Earth, and the sun is down here. So now we depart here, and we station keep for 30 days, and uh, then come back to Earth. This is the uh, lunar orbit uh, of, of the Earth. Uh, and and uh, what this is a six-month round trip. There's a one-year round trip and anything in between, so we can stagger two launches, get one group there, they'll get there at the same time, the next group arrives. Now we have redundant crews, redundant everything, propulsion system to, to bring people back on the, on the return maneuver. Uh, we can do the same thing uh, with Apophis. We heard a lot about Apophis. Uh, its path like this in 2021 is around like this. So it, it makes this kind of a, a path around the Earth. The sun is this way, and here's the Earth. So uh, this is a one-year round trip with a 30-day stay. And we go down like this and make a maneuver here, stay with Apophis and uh, then depart and come back to the Earth. A little bit more uh, aggressive. Now, 2022 is an opportunity. Actually, the uh, opposition time would arrive sometime in early 2023 for us to implant an exploration module unmanned on Phobos with uh, Steve Squires, he assures me he can do all the things necessary to land something robotically uh, from, from Earth, 
and even we can begin to put up some uh, radiation protection. We want to be on the, the Mars-facing part of Phobos. And uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, Bob Richards there uh, and, and some of the uh, Optech tests that they've done on prime missions going to Phobos. <clears throat> Incidentally, in this year, the Russians planned another mission to Phobos. They've never succeeded. Uh, it's now scheduled for 2011, and it may have funding problems doing that. But it's got a Chinese payload on a sample return from Phobos. Where do you suppose Russia wants to go with our money while we sit here and contemplate the lunar dust and helium-3? Um, anyway, there, there are a lot of exciting things, and you know I can't tell you uh, what kind of launch vehicles we need to carry these things out in 2025. But how many years is that from now? Now, if we had a new launch vehicle with new boosters, I can guarantee you whoever made the new boosters would be dead set against anything replacing it for the next 20 years. I'm sure of that. Especially since it's reusable in the ocean, in the salt water, and you take it apart and you train it back to Utah and you fill it full of high explosive and you train it back here, and that's reusable. We can do a little better with liquid reusable rockets. And, and let's say we, we had what exists now, four segment solids and an ET size with engines on the bottom and in line. If you put a shuttle C, eventually I think you're gonna wanna move the engines from side mount underneath. So why not do that right away? Now you've got something that really isn't new, and you can replace the solids at some time with four small, not so small, liquid flyback boosters, and then after a while, two medium-sized liquid flyback boosters. Then you go the big step, and you have a big tank with recoverable engines on the bottom in the ocean, high quality engines, a bunch of them, the tank goes into orbit and we know by planning ahead what to do with that big volume in low Earth orbit. We can use that, certainly. Many people can use it. And we got two big flyback boosters. That's one way of getting to the way that will begin to take lots of people or lots of payload for solar power satellites. We need to have a plan that could let us get these things. Uh, how many, well, there are a lot of people that are, uh, were born well after the first shuttle landing. And that's all they know is shuttle landings for US people coming back. Do they think it's progress for the next 20 years to be landing in the ocean just because it's the cheaper way to deliver cargo first and then return cargo from the space station. And then having done that, you got the foot in the door. So obviously, if you put people in that capsule, that's going to be cheaper than something else that's a lifting body runway lander that the Europeans would like. They, they kind of liked the idea of Hermes on an Ariane at one time, and the Japanese kind of liked the idea of Hope on the H2. And the Indians would probably like to leapfrog ahead of Shenzhou. And the US could sure develop a common international lifting body runway lander. If we pass up the opportunity, I don't think it's going to come back again. I'm really important. I feel quite strong that, that it doesn't affect particularly the destinations you're going to, but it certainly affects the indication, the, the impression of progress in this country. Is it, was it a bad idea years ago? And was it a bad idea for all the 28, 30 years of landing on a runway? I don't think so. We've studied lots and lots of lifting body runway landers. 
Were they all a mistake? I think we would be making a mistake to pass up the opportunity to, to do this at this uh, fork in the road. And I hope that we think very carefully about our long-term future before we decide which fork in the road we're gonna take. As the two deviate, it's more and more difficult to ever jump back to the other path. You gotta do an awful lot to, to change your path. Sure, there are a lot of people that don't wanna change right now. Um, but somebody's gonna have to live with what we don't change. And uh, I'll probably find some scuba diving island in the South Pacific to watch it happen. Thank you very much. I think, I think the man has a few fans in this room. Um, thank you very much, Buzz. It's always a pleasure uh, to have you. Uh, and we can always rely on Buzz to be a guest of honor. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to say just before I introduce our next speaker is that um, when you think about it, there's been life on this planet for close to four billion years. That's a four with how many? Nine zeros? And uh, in my lifetime, life has taken that f a first step off this planet in four billion years. How scary and how exciting is that? How much more scary and exciting do you wanna, do you wanna have it? Uh, with that in mind, um, I always feel that we do not let our children inherit this planet from us. We borrow it from them. We borrow Earth from our kids. And with that in mind, um, the main purpose of our awards today is for the uh, Student Innovative Technologies and Space Development Design Awards. And for that, I'd like to ask Lynn Zielinski to join me here on the podium. Lynn is a board member. She heads up our Education Outreach Committee, and she's also a teacher from Illinois. Lynn Zielinski. <laughs> 